Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us back together again to continue on in our consideration of the time of the end in Daniel's last vision, uh, which we believe is a key to bring these lines of prophecy into clarity as we bring them over the top of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Please help us to recognize these things and uh, make them part of our, our own understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. So we looked at Daniel 10, 1, end of 70 years, time of the end, and we're approaching it from the premise that if you don't know when and where to locate the time of the end, then you won't be able to line up prophecy correctly. And we're approaching it from the point that the, the prophecy that's designed to bring the final revival among God's people is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. So when we come to that prophecy, this emphasis of knowing where to put the time of the end is of supreme importance in those verses. So in 10, 1 is when the vision, Daniel's last vision, begins. And when you get to Daniel 11, verse 1, um, Daniel isn't changing the date of the vision. He's just reminding, Gabriel's just reminding Daniel that he also um, was there to strengthen Darius, or Darius. And in verse 1 of Daniel 11, it says, Also in the first year of Darius, the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And <clears throat> this confirms not only, this doesn't just give us another witness for a time of the end, but it broadens what we came to understand of the time of the end as time progressed. When I first understood the time of the end, I thought it was a point in time. 1798 was the time of the end, period. That's all there is to it. But as the line of the tribe of Judah opened these things up, we realized that the time of the end, more often than not, is marked by two historical figures. Here in Daniel's vision, we got Cyrus and Darius. Um, at the time of the end and the time of Christ, we have John, the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Christ. The time of the end and the time of Moses, we have the birth of Aaron and the birth of Moses. And as we come to 1989, our time of the end, we see two presidents, Reagan and Bush the first. So the Lord opened up the time of the end as a point in time, but over, as he developed this truth, we came to understand that two historical figures will mark the time of the end. So verse 1 of Daniel 11 is also the time of the end. And then in your notes, if you're still in your notes on page 3, I have verses 6 through 8, and I haven't reviewed these notes recently, so we'll read these, and it may take me a second to think, think through the logic, but we'll do that. I'm on page 3 of your notes, and it, there isn't much to read. You, you, it's just a column there. It says Daniel 11. We just did Daniel 11, 1, and I'm saying that the first year of Darius uh, was 537 slash 38, depending. There's two ways to look at that year, um, but that's also a time of the end, also a conclusion of 70 years, and it goes together with verse 1 of Daniel 10, and it provides two historical witnesses, Cyrus and Darius, that corresponds to John the Baptist and Jesus, Moses and Aaron, and it's speaking to the time of the end in 1989 with Ronald Reagan and George Bush the Greater. The next time of the end is verses 6 through 8, Okay, so let's read verses 6 through 8. At this point, all we're doing is looking for the time of the end. We will go back through, Lord willing, and, and make sure that we're familiar with all the details of these verses later on in this study. But in verse 6, it says, And in the end of the years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But... She shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times, but out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. 
and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Now, it would be nice if we all were real familiar with those, the history of those verses, um, but I, I have a hunch we probably aren't. But these verses are the key to open up Raphi and Paneum. Okay, so... Um, If you go up to verse 5, it's identifying, if you go before verse 5, it's identifying the disintegration of Alexander the Great's empire into four areas. But ultimately, those four areas are going to be consolidated into two areas. And in verse 5, one of those areas is the king of the south. It says, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes. The king of Egypt had a general that was one of his main guys that's going to break away from him, and that general is going to go gobble up the east, the west, and the north. And he's going to have to overcome those three geographical areas. He initially was a general of the king of the south, but he goes, he takes control of the east, the west, and the north, and when he's conquered that third geographical area, he's now the king of the north. And that's a, a truth that we need to deal with too as we proceed through Daniel 11 about these three steps of conquering. So in verse 5, that's what's going on. It says, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, this general, and he shall be strong above him. This general is going to get stronger than the king of the south and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion because he's going to conquer the east, the west, and the north. So the way we mark this is that right here, this king of the north has just overcome the east, the north, and the west and become the king of the north. And he's broke away from the king of the south. And from this point on in Daniel 11, it's going to be about the king of the north and the king of the south. And verses 6 through 8, it says at the end of the year. So we, we've got to mark the, the time here that he has consolidated his three conquerings. And then down here is the end of the years, and in here, there's going to be a truce, um, a peace treaty. Okay, so this is, I've seen this in my notes. This is 252. Um, let me see if I can dig all these dates out from my notes. Uh, Battle of Ipsus. All right, I'd have to... Uh, maybe I'm almost there. Does anyone have these dates? Okay. If, uh, if this is... He took the east in 301. He took the, the west in 286. And he took the north in 281. So now he is the king of the north, 281 B.C. And this verse 7 and 8 is 246. And these are all B.C.s. Okay, and 40, 46 from 81 is what? You don't get your calculator. 46. <laughs> All right, use your calculators if you have to. 35, isn't it? Is it 45? No, 81. 81, 46. A 6 from an 11 is 5. And the 8 goes to 7 and 4 from... Three is 35. 35 and 46 is 81. So this period of time is 35 years. Okay, that's worth noting because this has given us the first witness to the 1260 years of papal rule. Because the papacy in 538 is going to become the king of the north. And what marks 538? It's when the Goths are driven out of Rome. So the Goths is the third. One, two, three. 
The papacy has removed those three horns, just as it was in this history. Now the papacy is going to rule the world supremely for 3.5 prophetic years. Isn't three and a half years, 1260 prophetically? That's why you want to be straight about this. This is 35 years, and it takes you to 1798. So verse 7 and 8 is talking up here, is talking about this history here, where the king of the south is going to come and retaliate against this king of the north right here. So what is 246 B.C.? It's the time of the end, because 1798 is the time of the end. And when you get into detail in this history, in 1797, what does Napoleon do with the papal power? Forms a treaty. Forms a treaty. Okay, so um, that's worth noting, okay, because this is giving you two witnesses that before you get to this way, Mark, which is the time of the end, there's got to be a peace treaty. And this time of the end is going to come into our history as well. And it's going to give two witnesses that before you get to that way, Mark, there has to be a peace treaty. Okay, do you know what I mean? Okay, if this is... Pardon me? Well, 1989, you might want to make that argument, but that's not the argument I'm making. I'm making the argument that here, the papal power ruled the world supremely for 1260 years, 3.5 prophetic years, 1260 years. But papal Rome was prefigured by pagan Rome, which according to Daniel 11:24 ruled the world supremely for 360 years. And what begins that 360 years is the Battle of Actium. And down here, the kingdom is divided. So if this comes into our history, and we've already shown in these series that it does, then before you get down here, what are you going to have right here? Some kind of peace treaty that's noted. Okay? But this history here, it takes place from the Sunday Law until Michael stands up, and it also takes place from the Midnight Cry to the Sunday Law. So among other things, these two lines are telling us something about a treaty. Okay, a treaty becomes a, a way mark that we need to put in place. But that's not exactly what we're dealing with now. All we're dealing with now is that verses 6 through 8 give us this history that we've dealt with before that takes us to 246 B.C. And it typifies this history of the 1260 years. It takes us to 1798. So verse 6 through 8 marks a time of the end. You see that? Okay, how about verses 9 and 10? <clears throat> so the king of the south shall come into his own kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. What is this? What's this typify? Okay, almost. Well, but this is an earlier history sense. that's typifying 1989, right? Right? Yes. Okay, so verse 9 is also the time of the end because 1989 was the time of the end. This is the, uh, the history here, looking at this, the king of the north is defeated, and in verses 9 and 10, is it, that we just read? the king of the north is going to retaliate against the king of the south, and that retaliation typifies the response of the, Soviet, the response of the papacy in the United States against the Soviet Union in 1989. So verses 9 and 10 is also the time of the end. The difference 
here is this time at the end is typifying 1798 versus 9 and 10 is typifying 1989. You with me, Brother Jason? Okay, um, verse 16. Um, pardon me? 16? Yeah, I'm just going off my notes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just looking at the times of the ends. I'm not trying to walk through the entire chapter. Um, verse 16, I'm saying, is the time of the end. It says, But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed. This is Pompeii, primarily when we deal with this, we deal with Pompeii because he stands in the glorious land, Pompeii does. But verse 16, before he gets to the glorious land, it says, But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land. So the he here is coming against him. The first phrase, right? You got he and him. And the he is the one that stands in the glorious land. Yes? Yes. Okay, so who's the him? At the very beginning of the verse. But he that cometh against him. Who's him? That would be the king of the south. Would. Let's, uh, how I, would you determine that? I look at this as the same thing as Daniel 11.40. And the, and the phrase, shall do according to his own will, is hinting of the papacy, as in verse uh, 36. So he that shall come against him, the he that shall come against him, does according to his own will. Well, well wait a second, though. Before you... Before you jump to the application of verse 40. If you weren't going to go there, how would you do it? How would you determine who the him is if you were going to... As far as uh, grammatically? Yes. By going up... To the previous the verse. Previous yes. So, so what's the previous verse say? So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So the king of the, king of the, north. King of the north has just wiped out the king of the south. And verse 16 says, But he that cometh against him, against the king of the north. Okay. Oh, you mean the okay. one that got wiped out? Yeah, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. Okay, so what I'm saying here is in term, this is, Uriah Smith would tell you that this is the rise of what I call pagan Rome. This is the rise of pagan Rome. And the st second step of pagan Rome's rise to power, once it starts moving forward through history, is the glorious land. But the first step is when he takes out the king of the north, when he takes out Macedonia and Syria. Okay, he first takes them on. You see that? So, how many obstacles is, is pagan Rome going to have to overcome in order to be established in the world? Three. Okay, so, what's the first one? It's, it's right there. But he that cometh against him, him is his first obstacle. But he that cometh against the king of the north. Who's the king of the north in verse 15? It's this Syria-Macedonian relationship. Now Italy's going to come and start its rise, and it subdues the king of the north. Yes? Yes. Okay. So the first step for Rome was to the east of it. It was to, to the east of Rome. Okay, so what's Daniel 8, 9 says? Say, says. Daniel 8, 9 says, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, and waxed exceedingly great toward the south, towards the east, and toward the pleasant land. Okay, it takes on the east, which the east 
at that point in time is the king of the north. Which is Syria? Yes. And he conquers him in 65 B.C., that's how Uriah Smith's going to tell it, and he can conquer the glorious land next in 63 B.C. You all with me? So my point here is, in verse 16, even though we may have got a little bit deeper than we thought we were going to do, the he, when it says, but he, this is the beginning of pagan Rome's rise to power. But he that cometh against him, the first obstacle in this verse that he's going to take, is this king of the north that has subdued the king of the south in verse 15. So the king so the of the south is coming back against the king of the north. Yes, Rome is. Rome's coming against the king of the north. going to become the king of the north once he conquers him. So just to make sure that he there in verse 16 would be Rome. Yes. Okay. And like he's going to conquer the, the former king of the north in 65 B.C., Syria. So, th so then that would be saying what, what I said earlier. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will. That's Rome. That does according to his will. Yes. Okay. And you just you had the, the south and north tweaked a bit, but now you're at the point where you were at the point that I want to get to. What's the, what is what's happening when he that cometh against him prevails? He wins. He wins. What's he win? Land. No, no, the glorious land's next. The glorious land says, and okay. he shall stand in the glorious land. That's next. Okay, he, uh, king of the south. He, he, well, you're saying that in the, in the terminology of verse 40. That's not what we're looking for. He's conquered his first obstacle. Yes, and his second obstacle is the glorious land. And then the following verses, he's going to conquer Egypt. So if he conquered his first obstacle there in verse 16, now put it into verse 40. What is it? It's 1989. The first obstacle was the king of the south in, in, in verse 40. The first obstacle is the time of the end. When you conquer the first obstacle, it's the time of the end. You follow the logic? You? Okay. So verse 16 is 1989, time of the end. Verse 19. for another time at the end. And what do I, in your notes, what do I have? Yeah, well, why is the close of probation the time of the end? Because the close of probation is the time of the end, as by the most basic level. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the, at the level of, well, this is the end of time, but the, the, I'm looking for the prophetic reason. The time of the end is the end of a time prophecy. Yes. Did you? Yes. Did, you, did anyone else see her, hear her say that? Uh, no, we didn't hear that. Okay, we got it recorded. Okay, the time of the end is the end of a time prophecy. The t 1798 is the end of a time prophecy, is it not? Yes. Uh, the, the line on the top, the 35 years, end of 35 years. With pagan Rome, the time of the end is the end of a time prophecy, 360 years. And with pagan Rome, this battle of Actium not only lines up with the midnight cry, but the battle of Actium also lines up with the Sunday law. And the 360 years of Daniel 11, 24, the 360 symbolic time from the Sunday law goes to the close of probation when Michael stands up. Why is that? I mean, what's your prophetic justification? Midnight cry begins with the first Sunday law. That's the Battle of Actium, and it goes to the Sunday Law in the United States, Daniel 11:41. But that history is repeated. That's the image of the beast history. That's the doubling of the midnight cry. So the image of the beast testing time in the United States begins with the Sunday Law, the first Sunday Law, and ends with the Sunday Law. But the image of the beast testing time in the world begins with the Sunday Law in the United States, and it goes to the universal Sunday Law. And Sister White says, when this law becomes universal, then the Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. Something like that. That's the close of probation. So the image of the beast testing time, whether it's in the United States or the world, it begins and ends with the Sunday law. But you can show that that's the 360 years of Daniel 11:24, from Actium until the kingdom's divided. When you get to Daniel 11:40 40 to 45, the kingdom's divided. 
between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. That's Constantine in the year 330, dividing the kingdom to east and west. So at the end of a time prophecy, the 360, you can line up with the 1260, which you can line up with the 35. The end of a time prophecy is the time of the end. Therefore, the close of probation, whether it's the closed door in the United States, Daniel 1141, or the closed door when Michael stands up, is the time of the end. You got that logic? Yes? Can you teach it? It's, it is. It works. Verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor battle. Why is that the time of the end? What about? At, at, at his birth. He's the, one, he, the raiser of taxes. This is why Joseph and Mary got to go to Bethlehem, because of this raiser of taxes. And that's the time of the end. The time of the end is in that verse. Okay, verse 22. And with, pardon me? I understand what it, what it represents. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. What's that? That's the death of Tiberius and the death of Christ. Yeah. Why is it the time of the end? I thought the birth of Christ was the time of the end. It would be a different subject. It was, you could say it would be the time of the end for, for, for Satan. Because, yeah, because it, at the cross, every, he, he, was, he was exposed. Yes. That, that, that's it. You know, he's, he's done for you know, on, on that level. But would you, would you agree that at the end of 1260 years, you've reached the time of the end? Yes. Would you agree that... Uh, in the week that Christ confirmed a covenant, that you can place the 2520 against the northern kingdom in there with a day year relationship. Yes. And therefore, the end of the 1260 is the time of the end in either case. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cross would have to be the time of the end also. Yes. Because the 1260 the, ends there. Same thing is the same thing as the 2520. Yep. Yep. Everyone follow that? Okay. Why, why does it matter? Because when we come back into these lines of history in Daniel 11 and want to bring them to Daniel 11, 40 to 45, we need to know where to start these histories. We need to know where to locate the time of the end and when and where. And up until here recently, I don't know that anyone recognized how many time of the ends are in Daniel 11. Okay, that was verse 22. Uh, verse 23 is one of my favorite, if you have allowed to have favorites. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. This is the, the league that the Jews made with the Romans in 158 and that they implemented in 161. Um, they're on the chart. Uh, they are... Sacred history, but wh why is that the time of the end? How is that the time of the end? We've went over this before here. There's two historical figures associated with this, two brothers. The brother, and if I recall it right, their family name is the Maccabees, okay? And Judah, I believe, is the brother that goes to Rome and secures the, the league in 158. And in order to bring a battle to an end, his brother, I guess it would be, what, three years later. Is it going, is that the right way? Is this 80? Yes. Three years later, in 161, his brother uses the league to end a war with 
Greece or Macedon. And those two brothers represent who? They represent Ronald Reagan and George Bush, or Aaron and Moses, or John the Baptist and Christ, or Darius and Cyrus. They're marking the time of the end, and that league that they form, when you, when you look at it in terms of Reagan and Bush, did Ronald Reagan form a league with Rome? A secret alliance and appointed an ambassador and what did George Bush do he called for a new world order which is the the papacy's goal of all goals is to take control of the world again so verse 23 is the time of the end as well verse 24 and here's the one where where I'm getting speaking to what Deborah brought up yesterday or on Sabbath, not yesterday. Um, he shall enter peaceably upon, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and the riches. Yea, sh yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. This is that 360-year time period. Um, and I don't know if you've caught it, but we've identified the end of the 360 year time period as the time of the end and also the beginning. Okay, because when at the Battle of Actium, pagan Rome has just conquered its third obstacle, so the beginning would be the 360 year or the, the time of the end. But also the 360 parallels the 1260, and at the end of the 1260, you've got a time of the end. So you've got a time of the end on both the beginning and the end of the 360, and this is the 360. And as we go down through these verses, you're going to see two more verses where it talks about the time appointed being the time of the end, and it's the same 360-year period. That's why I'm saying it may not be 22. It may be whatever, whatever that would be, 20 or 19, where this same time of the end is being marked. So verse 24, the 360 years is the time of the end, and that 360 years is referred to in verse 27. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And Uriah Smith will tell you this end is the year 330, when the kingdom is divided to east and west, west by Constantine. And in verse um, 29, it's going to use, do the same thing, and at the time appointed, he shall return. Okay, that time appointed also, the end of the 360, so verse 27 and 29 are times of the end, but there's something to, that I'll run by you now, so you, we, we run this bias a couple times. It's a passage that's difficult for me to get in my head, so I assume it might be for others. In verse 27, when it says, And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. Who are the two that are speaking lies at one table to each other that are going to do mischief? Antony and Octavius. Yeah, Antony and Octavius, who also is Augustus. Okay, so it's these two Roman guys and in this verse, it's talking about the end being at the time appointed, which would be the year 330. But they would have had to spoke lies at one table before the 360-year period began. Why? This is the, the part you really you need to settle into. See, it's talk, it's, verse 24 introduces the 360-year period, and verse 27 and verse 29 is talking about the end of the 360-year period. So from verse 24 to verse 29, it's about these 360 years. And in verse 27, it's talking about Anthony, of Anthony and Cleopatra fame, sitting at a table with Augustus Caesar, who at that time is called Octavius Caesar, and lying to each other, but where does Anthony die? Where does Anthony die? 
Yeah. In the Battle of Actium. Yeah, he dies at, at the beginning of the 360 years. Right? So, when did they set and tell lies to each other? Had to be before. Has to be before. So, what do you see? There's some kind of treaty right here. This is another line. They're sitting at a table before the 360. Remember, this, this 360 was repeated twice. Before, the, before Anthony dies, he's got to sit down at a table with Augustus and make some kind of agreement that he's lying about and that Augustus is lying about. And I'm saying that this 360 is repeated over here with 362. So whatever this treaty is, it's probably May 14th, right? Probably May 14th, but it keeps coming up in this history. It has to happen before the time of the end that begins the period when the papacy rules supremely. Papacy rules supremely from the Sunday law in the United States until Michael stands up. But the papacy rules supremely in the United States from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, because those are parallel histories. So before you get to the midnight cry, Anthony and Octavius got to sit down at some table and strike some kind of agreement. And Anthony is representing at that point Egypt and Octavius Rome. And I would think Egypt. Would July 18th be the time of the end? Perhaps, but I, I said May 14th. I don't understand why. Because on May 14th, you've got a, the leaders of the world coming together with the Pope of Rome to push his agenda on global warming and, uh, and introduce a God that his fathers never knew before, the goddess Pachamama. And he's, he's going he's gonna to conquer them with a small people. We've read that already. Yeah. Verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Now I know what that means about the Jews helping the Romans in that history. But the Pope of Rome isn't going to use the Jews. What small people? And I already, well, you and I already talked, so you can't say. Uh, in Africa, Odilio put a five-second rule on me. He would ask a question and I'd automatically answer it. So he put a five second rule on me. He'd ask his question, just this five second rule where I couldn't say anything for five seconds to get everyone else opportunity to speak. What's the small people? Five second rule on you. No. In the Bible there are small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Who's the small people? It's the minorities. It's the homosexuals. It's the the, the, the minority cultures, in any, it's, it's, it's the same agenda as global warming. It's, and he's going to use that liberal program to capture the world. And as he does so, he's typifying the Catholic attack on this movement. And, and really, what you're saying, uh, that reflects... Every now and then when I look at the news, that's what he continually, not continually, but almost continually hammers at about the minorities. Yes. Yes. And so do P and T? Yep. Yes. Okay. Fits. Yeah, they're, they're Jesuit plants. They're echoing his agenda in, this, in this, this time period. Okay. So, verse 30. Why is verse 30? By now... You should be able to work these through yourself. So, verse 30 says, For the ships of Chittim, and I want to throw in here just as a way of reminding us in advance, where is Chittim? Carthage. Carthage. And why is Carthage significant in Bible prophecy? You're reading it. Go ahead. It was used as an, a base of operations for the Vandals in their war against the Roman Empire. And who are the Vandals, prophetically? 
prophetically what would be Islam. Well, yeah, that. Well, but yeah. who were they in Revelation eight and nine? The, one of the, the second yeah. trumpet. Okay, so Chittim is a symbol of a trumpet power. Uh, the second trumpet, and you're right. As we bring it down in the world, they're the symbol of Islam. And I argue that other than the expression East in verse 44 of Daniel 11, this is the only reference to Islam in Daniel's last vision. And it's not a, it's not a major reference. My point being is the story of Daniel is the story of the North and the story of Revelation is the story of the East. The tidings of the East and the North is the combination of Daniel and Revelation together. And so when we're trying to work through Raphia and Paneum in Daniel 11, I think we have to approach it from the king of the north, not, not try to force Islam into those battles. Islam may be there, but they're there by laying a line over the top that comes from the book of Revelation. Just saying that they're not, there's really not a lot said about Islam. So verse 30 says, and For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, Therefore, he shall be grieved. And Sister White's going to quote now from there to verse 36, word for word, and says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. So this is a really, this is the sig most significant passage in Daniel 11, probably in the spirit of prophecy context. She's going to quote these verses all the way to verse 36, every single word, and says, scenes similar to those described in these words shall take place. So we need to know what these words are. Yes. So who, who exactly is Chittim? It's, Chittim is, a, is the name of Carthage. It's the old world name for Carthage. And Carthage is where Genseric would launch his battles against Rome. He was a sea power. He cut off their, economic, their economics by destroying their trade routes. And he was the second trumpet. Um, so you can read into that once you bring that, those trumpets down to our history, you can show that, that he lines up with Islam. Um, Islam is the east wind that is going to sink uh, the, the ships of Tarshish in the midst of the sea. And return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy co Covenant. Um, why is this, is this verse 30? Yes. Why is this the time of the end? <coughs> right. Ship, I don't. Yeah. Reagan. Have, an intelligence. Have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant? Yes. Have an intelligence with the Catholic Church. Is it? Maybe. I don't know. Yep. And what's the indignation against the Holy Covenant? Persecution. Sad. Pardon me? Persecution Sad. and uh, the Bible made, well, let's see. anyway, yeah, persecution, for, yeah, description of the Bible. I told you I'd have to think this through. You, you may be right, but it's not clicking on me. And this is a very special one. You'll notice in your notes, yeah, you got I got close of probation in small letters with the asterisk. And I did that on purpose because there's something um, peculiar about this, about the argument about why this is the the time of the end. That's what we're looking for. Pardon me. End of pagan Rome. Justinian began to write the law books to make Catholic the corrector of heretics. Yeah. Appointment of the bishop of Rome to be the head of the church. Why does that mark the time of the end? Okay, let's read verse 31. Verse 31 says, An arm shall stand on his part. That's 496. Clovis standing up for the papacy. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. That's the warfare of Rome. Shall take away the daily. That's for 508. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That's 538. Ships shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved. What's the indignation against the Holy Covenant? 
According to Uriah Smith? I, I, I believe it's the restriction of the Bible. Yeah, because of the, the Arians. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not remembering why that's the time of the end. I'm going to have to... He had his, well, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of Constantine, actually. Uh, when I was going to say he print, had his own Bible printed or something. Okay, let's pass over that one. We'll have to come back to that when... I'm going to claim jet lag. Since Justinian was, like I said, was writing the law books to make Catholics to be the corrector of heretics, that's the corpus. I don't know if that helps. Seven yeah, but uh, th those histories, I'm, I'm not, not, it's not clicking why I'm calling that the close of probation. Was at the time, at the end, 1989, like Kathy was saying, that you that you have uh, Reagan having intelligence. That's what we've all, I mean, that's what you bring out in the time of the end. Yeah, okay, so that must be 1989. I'm, what's throwing me is what I saw that I made it. Post-probation with an asterisk. Yeah. yeah, with little letters. There's something else in there. But okay, let's go with that and leave it. Um, that worked. 1989. The, um, it was 1984. That history that he appoints an ambassador. Okay. Progressive time. Period of time. Verses 35 and 36. This is an easier one. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. So, that's pretty easy from verse 35. He's going to prosper till the time of the end. That's 1798. It's a time appointed. The, the second witness of that is verse 36. He's going to prosper till the indignation be accomplished. What's that? That's a 2520 that ends in 1798. Second witness to that date. And it was determined that that would be done. So verse 35 and 36, 1798. Verse 40, we know. We have, and at the time of the end, 1798. Collapse of the Soviet Union, 1989. We've got two times of the ends there. Verse 44 and 45. Why is verse 44 and 45 the time of the end? Come to his end. We've already... We've already established that up here. 1798, when the papacy receives its deadly wound, is typifying the final demise of the papacy when it comes to its end with none to help. In 1798, it's going to have some to help, but not at the close of probation. So if 1798 is the time of the end, the close of probation is the time of the end. That's the logic there. And then in verse 4, easy one. Daniel 12, 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. 1798 and 1989, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I also have December 2016 and January 11th, 2020. <clears throat> Why would I have that? December 16th. Just like with the, uh, well, no, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking 2013. Um. December 2016 is when Rafi and Paneum comes to light, and it lines up with the first disappointment of Millerite history when the Lord removed his hand. Right? Yes? And when did he do that? 1844. On, on April 19th, technically. Yeah. I mean, the year 1843 was passed. And the year 1843, when it concluded, it's the end of a time prophecy, isn't it? It's the end of the... The what? No, it isn't. 1843 is not the end of the 2300. Are you, willing, are you William Miller? That's what he thought. 
What time prophecy ends in 1843? The 1335. The 1335. And the 1335 is a time prophecy. At the end, it is the time of the end. And that is when the Lord removes His hand from the fullness of the year mistake. That's the first disappointment. And the Lord removed His hand from our fullness of the year mistake, our misunderstanding of the King of the South, in December of 2016. So I'm arguing that's kind of a time of the end. What about January 11th, 2020? This is Gideon coming right back to where he started. And the story of Gideon begins when the book of Daniel is unsealed and there's an increase of knowledge and it's going to end at the same place. If you remember this morning's presentation. The third touch. He went down into the enemy's camp. The book of Daniel's been unsealed one more time. That's, you know, this might be a little bit of a stretch, but let's go to verses 9 and 10. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And I have for that 1989. You could have 1798 there too, no sweat. But is it a stretch to say December 2016 and January 11th? Is the book of Daniel unsealed in December of 2016? Is there an increase of knowledge on the book of Daniel? Yeah. Was there a truth that had been sealed up, unsealed? Yes. Oh, yeah. It was the, uh, Rafi and Paniam. Uh -huh. Okay, and there, there, there was the, it was supposed to be an increase of knowledge, but we didn't do our due diligence. But nevertheless, it was a time of the end at that level. And I'm arguing that on January 11th, it's happened again. So, what would that mean? What would happen, what would begin on January 11th if there was an increase of knowledge? Based upon what we've read. The opening, well, I want to say the opening up of uh, January 11, but it's already been opened up, but it's even more, it, things are coming more clear from that time. Okay. That, that works, but what I'm getting at is verse 10. But I'll read verse 9 again. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So to be a... shall understand at January, starting at January, at January 11th. And be tested. Yeah. Three-step testing yeah, process. Be the then? It's leading up. It's to leading that. up to. They're going to be tested they on the been, light. They've even been um, tried. It's three steps. Purified. purified. What's purification? Here we go. First, second, and third angels' message. It's the first angels' message. It includes all three. Right. What's white? Gets made sin, white. Sin out. It's the righteousness of Christ. But what is it? Sure. It's the second. But what is it? It's a visual. Oh, yeah. It's the end sign. Okay. The end sign's about to be lifted up after January 11th. And so then, and then, no, it hasn't happened. And then they're going to be tried. What's that? When are you tried? Tested. You're tried when the door closes. Tried right. like, are you really? Litmus test. Yeah. When, when was uh, Daniel tried? Chapter 1. Chapter 1. At the end of the days, at the end of the three years, did he have three tests? His first test was? Diet. Diet. His second test was? V visual. He appeared fairer and fatter than all the rest, but he was going to study for three years, and at the end of the days, he was brought into Nebuchadnezzar, and he was tested to see 
if he had succeeded during the three years. The third test is the test where you prove. So if January 11th is actually a time of the end, then that message provides the, should provide all three right there and there at the beginning. But it should be where you're justified just before you're lifted up as an ensign. Because if that's the visual, you're going to appear fairer and fatter than all the rest. And it's going to lead to a closed door. Whether the closed door is July 18th, I kind of think it comes before July 18th or not. But anyway, um, verse 12. We're almost done here. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. I'm saying that that's December 6th. 2016 because that was typified by April 19th which was the first disappointment and was the conclusion of the 1335 days and it was blessed and how does that read blessed is he that waiteth and cometh and what does cometh mean in the Hebrew toucheth okay if you touch and what touches 1843 1844, if you come to that point, you're blessed if, you're on, if you stay on the right side of the issue. Um, and verse 13, But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Verse 13 could be a time of the end. <laughs> yeah, I have it as that. Okay. Yeah, it's at the end of the days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I have it as a little, I don't know what I meant by I forgot what I meant by the the yeah, little COP with the asterisk. asterisk. I have to sort that out. There's two things that I, when I'm thinking of the time of the end, considering all this, that I have, I've got to constantly struggle to know which one of these I'm in <laughs> are considering, and that is okay. The time of the end can be the beginning, a, a progressive. Uh, what's the word? History. What's that? History. Progressive or, history. Or a period of time. Yeah, period of time. Okay, beginning of a period of time. Okay, the time of the end. The end times. Yeah, the end times. Are, are we coming to an end of a time prophecy? You know, that's, that's, that's the two things I find I have to constantly grapple with. Yep. So that's the time then. I'm saying that's the key that we'll use to try to take those four topics, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and the 144,000 from Daniel's last vision and plug them in to Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Everywhere you got a time of the end in Daniel 11, you should be able to determine which time of the end it is and start whatever history's represented there and use the other key, and this, this handout, I never went over it, has the other keys. One of them is Rome establishes the vision. Use that key to open up what those histories represent. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we, we want to be benefited by the light that you're opening to us, so we ask that you continue to bring these truths upon our mind throughout the day, that we can um, settle into them, that we can handle them easily as we begin to proceed going through these verses in a way to place them in the, the pattern of verses 40 to 45. We thank you that you're opening your word for us at this time. Uh, we pray that you will continue to do so as we carry on this series in Jesus' name. Amen.